All right. Christ in capital, love God, love neighbor, build something. Uh, Nathan is back with us again today. How are you doing, Nathan? Hello, Dustin. Doing great. Awesome. Did you, uh, do you remember, I think a couple of months ago when we talked about Amy Coney Barrett and her confirmation, and we had that little discussion about, um, you know, whether or not certain politicians would try to pack the Supreme Court. Yeah. Yeah. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Um, you know, I'm waiting for the Babylon Bee headline that says something like, uh, breaking Republicans introduce legislation to pack the Oval Office. <laughs> <laughs> With Donald Trump in the background in a mustache disguise. And That's right. Anyways. Interestingly, um, Justice Breyer, who's one of the more progressive justices, had a great speech the other week all about why we shouldn't pack the Supreme Court because it'll lose yeah. all of its non-political value. And yeah. They have a ton of backlogged video about, you know, lots of politicians on the kind of left side saying we shouldn't. So, yeah. but anyways... Satire is a great thing, but we're not talking about that today. We're talking about education and work. And to do that, we brought on Brian Phillips. Thank you for coming on the show, Brian. Welcome. Oh, thanks, guys. Good to be with you. So, Brian, you have, uh, there are many facets to what you do. You have a whole bunch of different fields of study or expertise, I guess. Uh, can you give the audience just a brief, you know, couple sentences what do you do what what are all the different things that you do um yeah just throw it out there okay uh yeah so i'm i'm a pastor at uh the, the pastor at holy trinity reformed church in concord north carolina um i've been there for uh going on 13 years now and uh i've also been involved for uh goodness i guess 13 plus years, maybe getting close to 15 in classical education. Um, I've taught at uh, middle school, high school levels, college level. Um, and then I've worked for the Searcy Institute more in consulting and, and writing um, for about eight years. Um, and then over the last couple of years, I've come back around to uh, doing a, uh, or going into a field that I wanted to go into since I was a little kid. And that is uh, working in medicine and, um, I uh, finished EMT school about two years ago and have been working as an EMT with our, our county EMS. Um, and then um, recently, about five months ago, I uh, started working in a hospital setting uh, as a tech while in nursing school and um, done both uh, you know med surge and some progressive kind of care and working with the COVID unit a little bit too. So, um, so that's now while going into to nursing school. So yeah, a little bit all over the map, I guess you could say. I don't, I don't know that I would call any of those um, areas of expertise, but they are things <laughs> that I do. <laughs> it's kind of a, a jack of all trades, master of uh, a couple, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> just maybe, a couple of them. <laughs> maybe. Uh, yeah. I mean, outside of that, you know, obviously um, I'm also a husband. My wife and I are about to celebrate our 20th anniversary and we've got, we've got four kids, two boys, two girls. So, um, yeah, there's never a dull moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I've seen that, um, just in, in you following you on social media, I know we've kind of had our, we were introduced, um, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. so we've kind of kept up with each other and I just thought you were a great person to talk, talk about this with, but having both you and Nathan, on mm -hmm. the same call is going to be super easy for me because both of you guys are kind of, you, you have the same sentiments in um, what, what does it mean to work? What does education mean? Um, how should we be um, looking at the area, the ideas of specialization versus broad study or just kind of generalized study? Um, so that's what kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, with Christ in Capital, Nathan and I have kind of talked about economics a lot in the past and kind of the thinkers of the past couple, you know, um, centuries, just, you know, what are the kind of the big ideas in economics? Um, a lot of these guys were philosophers who contributed a lot to economics just because the, the fields are so um, closely related. Um, and so that, that's kind of the, 
where this started. I wanted to talk about that because of the economic aspect. But in talking with Nathan, I was like, well, we've, we've got to go back to education. What's the purpose of education? Um, and then how does that kind of translate into the work force? And so um, you currently work for a organization called Cersei. Is that, how, is that how it's pronounced? Cersei? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, can you give everyone just a, a brief introduction of what is Cersei? What is it? What is it all about? And what's this idea of virtue and wisdom that is kind of in the mission statement of, of Cersei? What is that all about? Yeah. Sure. Cersei is a, a basically a research institute. And in fact, the name itself is an acronym, the Center for Independent Research in Christian in Classical Education or the Center for Integrated Resources in Classical Education. So it works both ways. Um, plus, it's the name of a witch from the Odyssey um, which, <laughs> who turned men into pigs. So um, make of that what you will. OK, but, um, you know, it, uh, we we jokingly say this part isn't a joke, I guess, but we're trying to, you know, do the reverse. We're <laughs> trying to turn um, pigs into men, I guess. Um, and so we we do consulting. Um, we do for schools, for homeschool groups, uh, even for homeschooling parents. Um, we produce resources for educators, regardless of their their context. Uh, everything from podcasts to a very active blog to a magazine. We have a national conference. We do multiple regional conferences. We do on-site consulting. Um, we do webinars. Um, so all sorts of different resources for classical education. So that's basically the the work that we do is supporting classical educators, um, and and it's built around that idea of cultivating wisdom and virtue. Um, that's sort of it's not just our tagline or motto. That's kind of the purpose for which we do all of those things. It's aiming at that cultivating wisdom and virtue in both. Um, teachers, uh, including homeschooling parents and, and students. Okay. Okay. That's good. I think that's kind of similar. I mean, I, I'm new to the whole classical education thing. You know, I've never had another, you know, known that there was another side of education. Um, the, the common sentiment in, in, you know, public education right now is, you know, you go to school to get a good job. And then you, you even wrote an article recently about the circularity of that and how, right. you know, right. go to school, get a job so that you can provide for your kids to go to school and get a job, you know, it's the, right. that cycle. Um, so, and maybe Nathan, you can chime in here too. What is the, what's the issue that classical education tries to address? What's, why is it different? And what's, what is it trying to do? So Nathan, I guess you first and then Brian can chime in. Wow, well, that, that is a big question. Um, but we can, we can get into a few of the facets of it, particularly how it relates to the workplace. Um, one thing I'd like to say is that there's this weird assumption among most um, people that they divorce work from the whole person and they think jobs need to be done, work needs to be done, and we just need to get basically like living robots who have the skill in that job to go do it. And so in that way, work is very divorced from like who that person is, what their character is, what their habits are. Um, do they have any wisdom beyond skill in that one area? Um, can they learn? Uh, none of those questions are really asked. It's just, you know, do you have basically the data in your mind that will enable you to do this task? And that's historically not at all how work was understood. Work was understood as kind of an extension of the person. Um, this goes back all the way to the ancient Greeks, but Simone Weil in um, her book, Need for Roots, which she wrote right after, um, kind of actually right in the middle of World War II, she was asking the question, how did we get here um, where Europe's falling apart? And she focused actually on work and how everyone, the modern world had kind of totally turned work upside down and they had divorced it from what it means to be a human being. So kind of broad level, if you're talking about what does classical education try to contribute in terms of um, thinking about work, it tries to go back to kind of an earlier understanding of work as you're a, you're a whole person, you're a mind, you're a body, you're a soul, um, you have a character uh, or lack thereof, 
um, you have a history, you, uh, you learn, you grow, you develop, you're a worshiper. Mm -hmm. And all of those things are brought to bear in whatever field of work you're doing. And the idea being that uh, you work better and you become more human as you kind of join your work to your person. So yeah. when, when we talk about virtue and we talk about wisdom, we're talking about forming humans, um, whole humans, who then can go and they can do the work. And they, you know, on the side, you know, just as a side note, they usually do work better. The product is better, but it's not just looking at the product. Okay. Yeah, there's this kind of idea, or it seems to me like there's this tension between the two, or a perceived tension between the two where it's like, okay, one side is thinking more pragmatically, how do you get the job done? You know, that the end goal is the job and the success of the job, but the other side is more, um, as, as you guys are saying, in pursuit of virtue and wisdom. Um, so Brian, maybe this is something for you. And I think I've heard you speak on this a little bit. Um, what, so when we talk about education and the purpose of education, you, you had this concept of, um, you know, you have to understand what a human is before you can decide what education is for. Um, so right. we're not like Nathan was saying, we're not machines that hold data where, um, for human beings, but if you, if you get that one thing wrong, everything else downstream from that kind of you know, it's, it's going to be messed up. You're going to be in, in the wrong direct, going in the wrong direction. Sure. Um, can you kind of just flesh that out for us? What, how does, how does that, a proper understanding of man or what a human is, you know, translate into education? And is that inherently theological? Um, I, I think it is to answer that question first. I, I think if you, if you have the wrong theology of man, then you're going to have the wrong perspective on what man's purpose is. In mm -hmm. fact, I think if you miss the theology of man, then, then any purpose that you can attach to him is, um, is, is somewhat random. Um, and, uh, arbitrary. And, yeah. And it, yeah. It's arbitrary. Uh, it's relative. And so I don't know how in the world, you, you know, how do you take the idea that man is a cosmic accident and yet somehow also the most important thing in the world. And yet, <laughs> right. Those are two ideas that are presented in our culture all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, this whole idea of love yourself and self-care and, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, know your worth, blah, blah, blah. Well, okay, let's, let's take that idea. Um, if our culture is right, that we should love ourselves and know our worth, but we really are cosmic accidents, then that becomes a very depressing idea. You know, know, knowing my worth, if I'm an accident, um, uh, uh, then that's upsetting. Right? Yeah. There isn't any intrinsic worth. And then I just, I'm left to attach whatever worth I want in the context of fallen history where people show over and over again that they don't really value human beings, right? So, or they don't value one another. So this becomes really, really convoluted and contradictory. So um, I think you have to understand man in order to understand his work. And, and I think it's also important to understand that man was given work even before the fall, right? Work is not a result, it was not a consequence of the fall. Work was there beforehand. We are made to work. Um, and God made us in his image to work. Um, uh, and, and that brings him glory. I mean, our purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And one of the tasks that he, he gives to us, right, is to tend the garden, you know, right, to cultivate where we are. So you can't separate a person's work from the, the kind of person that they are. And I think and we see this everywhere. You know, you can go into, um, you can approach this from very deep philosophical theological works, or you could just take like your last trip to Walmart as an example, <laughs> right? Yeah. So we all know that experience of, you know, when you go to a business that has hired people who don't have wisdom, virtue, or a proper understanding of who they are, that they are made in the image of God and a proper understanding that work is, is something that is good, right? Something that we're made to do. 
then you all know what that's like, right? From the cashier who who doesn't seem to realize you're alive um, to uh, the waitress who has had a bad day and wants everyone to know it, right? Um, the coworker who just started work and and announces very quickly how ready they are to go home. You know, I mean, it's just, it's everywhere over and over again. So I don't think you can separate wisdom and virtue, the, the character of the person from the work that they do. They are, they are tied together in the, in the deepest theological and philosophical sense and in the most practical and external observable sense, right? We can see it all the time. Yeah. Um, but I do, I, I, I want to make, if I can just throw out a distinction here that I think is important, but is uh, really overlooked. And that is the difference between pragmatism and practical. Yeah. Um, and anytime something becomes an ism, it's normally that that's the problem, right? Um, and since this isn't my podcast and you guys will get the angry responses, I'll just go and throw all this out here, right? All there's, right. There's a big difference between community and communism. Okay. Yeah. Right? Um, and there's a big difference between femininity and feminism. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would argue that in both of those examples, they're complete opposites. Yep. Um, you know, communism drives a wedge between people and, and feminism seems to reject all that's genuinely feminine. Um, and so, uh, it, it's particularly in the extreme sense. Um, but pragmatism is not practical at all. Uh, pragmatism, which is basically the idea that whatever is useful at the time is good, right? That's a very quick, messy definition, I guess. But, um, so if it worked, then it was good, then it was the right thing to do, right? So if you get an education, you get your diploma, you get your degree and you get a job, right? Then it was, all, it was worth it, it was good. That was the aim, right? Um, but for example, when and I'm older than both of you guys, but when I was in high school, we were being encouraged to go into computer science. Like everyone go and work in computers, computer science, that's everything. And then, around the time I was in college, it was, it shifted to engineering. Like everybody needs to go into engineering, right? How many computer science jobs do you know of right now? I mean, how many people do you know who work specific, they got a computer science degree and they're working in computer science, right? I don't know any. The, um, the same with people who, you know, tons of engineering students who would graduate with engineering degrees. And then by the time that whole wave, that emphasis of you got to specialize in this, you got to get this, then those jobs are gone, right? There are very few fields where, or, and very few people, relatively speaking, that, um, that actually work in the field where, that they were educated for, or yep. I should say that they got a degree for. Yep. Um, and so the more you specialize, the less practical it actually is. So in the name of pragmatism, they're saying, you know, whatever is useful is, is good. So go get this degree because that's where all the good jobs are, right? You specialize in that. That's what you learn. That's what you know, that one thing. Then if the job is gone, then what do you do? Right? Well, that's not a very practical approach to life right. because practical um, is, is a very different idea. Uh, being practical is not a bad thing. Being a pragmatist is because they're not the same. Being practical is saying, okay, how can I use what I have for good? Or how can I, um, you know, how can I use my, my skills, my knowledge, my uh, experience for good? Um, that's not a bad thing at all. In fact, we're all called to do that very thing. Um, and so I think we have to make a distinction there between being a pragmatist and being practical. Yeah, it just seems like it turned. So the, the dichotomy that's set up is, you know, if you're doing generalized, uh, special, you need to specialize because specialists are the ones that make the money. They're the ones that are most useful. And then the generalists on the opposite side are more like, you know, vague, you're not really pursuing anything, but, it, but if you're, if you're thinking of more like a, um, uh, wide range of study like we've been talking with classical education and all that stuff pursuing the whole man you know all of that a, a a holistic study of the world that in the end turns out to be more practical than uh, uh you know a specialization temporarily um yeah 
So that, that was actually one of the questions I was going to ask you. So I'm, I'm glad you oh, okay. went ahead Sorry. And answered it. I jumped ahead. I jumped no, ahead. no, it's good. It's good. I don't know if I had that one on there, but anyways. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't remember seeing it, but, um, but I think medicine is a good example of this too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a special specialist for everything. And yet now, uh, you know, where the greatest lack is in the medical field is general practitioners. You know, so the, the family practitioner, the general practitioner, and even RNs, I mean, that's where the, the real need is because everyone has become so specialized um, that now there's no one to actually handle the whole picture, right? So, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's no broker that just kind of like, well, it, yeah. I mean, you, have, you have to have people that, I mean, I don't, how do you, what do you do if you don't have someone to tell you what specialists to go to? Yeah, you know, they, they can't even diagnose what what you might need. Um, and so, yeah. yeah. At, at, um, and Nathan, I'll let you chime in here, but I'm going to throw us all into some hot water real quick. Um, the idea of specialization has got us the whole country into a terrible economic situation in the past year. Um, we have certain individuals who are focusing on uh, strictly one aspect of this COVID scenario. The, the health situation, disregarding everything else. So all decisions are made based on this tiny little piece of the puzzle. Um, yeah, it, I think if we understood, if we understood more in a holistic sense the, or addressed these issues in more holistic sense, what are the trade-offs? What are the principles that need to be applied? All of that, I think it would be, um, we'd do better in my opinion. So could I jump in real quick? Just yep. Two quick anecdotes um, to kind of support what Brian's saying. I really like that clear distinction you made between pragmatism and practical. Um, one relates to COVID. Uh, so, you know, all this stuff's coming out um, about whether or not hydrochloroquine is useful, you know, on the front lines or not with the lung conditions caused by COVID. Yeah. And, and for the YouTube listeners, this is, this is April 20. 21 and not summer 2020 just yeah. because the that discussion it, was hot then Go is ahead. it really you know <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i guess you know you uh, never know just, i i feel like we've been in the same month for a mm. year now yeah yeah it's all right guys just fi just 15 more days to flatten the curve <laughs> <laughs> so i i was reading this um this peer-reviewed uh article in he was the Boston Medical Journal about a guy who'd compiled a lot of data from kind of frontline nurses about the usefulness of hydrochloroquine um, to enable people to breathe so that they didn't asphyxiate um, and so you know there's all this stuff going on, on Facebook one thing after another and so I send the article to one of my friends who um, is a scientist and he knows how to read the scientific literature and I just said like hey can you read this article and let me know if like the methods used are, um, are good, whether or not like he's going about this data the right way. And he got so upset with me and he said, that's not my field. Why do you think that I could read that article and tell you anything about it? And I was like, well, because you should know scientific methods. Like you, you should be able to read the literature even if you're not technically like in that exact field. Right. Why was the article written in the first place? Yeah, and he, he totally rejected that. And he said, look, like that's not how these things work. And it dawned on me that, okay, you've got all these people who are in this like minor, you know, very specialized field in, in different elements of science or medicine. And they don't even think that they should be able to cross those little almost imaginary lines that have been created with these mini fields and look at somebody else's um, analysis or data and have any opinion on it, which, which baffled me. So then all he said was, well, you just need to look at the consensus. What's the consensus? And I was like, well, it, this article is going against the consensus. And he's like, then reject it. And I thought that is so, that, that is so indicative of one of the main problems we have in society right now is mm -hmm. we worship specialists no one who's not in that mini field is allowed to have an opinion on it. So now it's just, what's the consensus? It's just majoritarian opinion in tiny fields rules the yeah. day. 
but who are these people who form this consensus? You know, right. it, it could be a very small batch of people. Mm-hmm. So that's one anecdote that relates to a, another one, which is I was sitting in a coffee shop and I was reading a book on um, philosophy of science, which I love reading about philosophy of science, just kind of getting underneath science and understanding what, what the methodology is and what it's going about. And I was sitting next to this guy who I struck up a conversation with and he teaches philosophy of science on to PhD students. And he said that uh, none of these guys can handle the classic philosophy of science texts like Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions or um, kind of any of the older texts. They, he said they can't handle it. They know math and that's all they know. They cannot think abstractly. They cannot analyze anything other than specific data points that they've been taught to analyze. So he said that he can't even assign a book that I read when I was in high school um, because he says they're, they're not gonna, they can't understand it. He says usually he gets like maybe one or two students who can talk about science in terms of philosophy, but the rest of them, they're just not equipped for it. Really? And so of course, when something like COVID happens and now there's all of this flurry of how do we understand this? How do we kind of make conclusions, make decisions? You get the mess that we're in because nobody has the ability to actually think about any of these things um, philosophically and nobody has the authority if they're not in that specific minor field to even have an opinion. Yeah. Is that kind of your experience, Brian? Yeah, and, and of course, consensus in that minor field is determined by the people they ask. Yeah. Right, and the people they ask is determined by what, well, now I'm getting into motives, but I, I yeah. still believe this anyway. Um, I, this is an arguable point because I am getting into motives. But then the people that you ask is determined by what answer you want. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So the, the idea that you go with the consensus because it's the consensus is the most anti-scientific idea ever. I mean, that, yeah. we would never, nothing would have ever been discovered. Right. Period. That's it. Not, nothing. Right. We would know nothing else in the, in the entire realm of science and medicine had we taken the idea that you just go with the consensus. Yeah. This is a weird situation where the, uh, where the Christians are the ones uh, calling on the Galileo example. <laughs> right. Well, in, in this case, the Christians are the most progressive. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. there's, there's been some great articles that have come out. There's one in first things. I can't remember the author, but just about how the kind of the new scientific establishment is the new religious establishment. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, yeah. when science becomes dogma, it loses everything that makes it science like that. And interestingly enough, like if you read Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions, which is all about like, how do we get advances in science? And he says, it's not with kind of a steady step-by-step flow of more information and data that leads us to greater and greater knowledge. It's actually like total paradigm shifts, a completely different way of looking at the data and putting it all together like a puzzle. And the people who you can point to historically who have been able to make those shifts, you know, uh, Galileo or Newton or Copernicus or Einstein, all of them were educated way beyond their specific expertise field. Yeah. They didn't just study science or just study math. They were what we would now call classically educated. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and two, I think to, I mean, we're, we're talking specifically here about the, the COVID phenomenon, I know, but, um, but I, I think if you if you step back even from that, if we're looking at the world of medicine, particularly in the U.S. and and probably in all of Western culture now, um, is that we don't actually even practice um, healthcare anymore. It's we practice sick care, right? We we study and deal with sickness. We don't actually address wellness, um, and so that's why when. Um, when we see when we see a a virus like this, which was which, which is um, directly related, of course, to the body's immune response and the respiratory system and all of that, uh, particularly COVID is, um, then we immediately think pharmaceuticals, 
right? Uh, because that's our approach to sickness. We don't think wellness. Okay, what do we do to actually boost the body's immune system? Um, mm -hmm. We just kind of cover it up. Um, and so that's why I think, um, and I haven't, I haven't looked at all the literature about um, hydrochloroquine, but um, vitamin, vitamin C, vitamin D have both been found to be very effective. Uh, zinc has been found very effective. And these are basic things that people um, have used for a long, long time to boost their immune system, right? But we don't talk about any of that, right? We talk about, um, you know, what, med what medicines, what prescriptions can we get? Um, what, uh, what sorts of breathing treatments and, and granted all the, those are wonderful things to be able to appeal to. Mm -hmm. Um, but I feel like we're, we're still, we're so specialized even in medicine that it, we're not really addressing health anymore. We're just addressing sickness. Yeah. Um, it's like a, by that infinite, point, it's, kind of, it's late in the game. Yeah. It's like a infinite uh, reactive endeavor. Yeah. I mean, you know, to that, I, to that point, Oh, go ahead. Now, as you say, again, Christians being the ones that are the progressive ones. Right. But go ahead. To that point, I was just thinking, like, if you were to um, approach this classically and look at some of the ancient medical texts, like you go to Hippocrates, right? Like where we get the Hippocratic Oath. And you read his text on medicine. And some of it's obviously bizarre. But he is very much focused on that wellness idea. Like, not simply like what are the symptoms that are manifested by a disease and how do we treat the symptoms but like what does the whole person need to do in order to get back into a state of wellness um and you know things like sun and fresh air they didn't necessarily understand vitamin d that like oh exposure to the sun boosts your vitamin d count um but they knew that sun and fresh air actually did help the body right and so now we know why but but it's still the same. Twenty five hundred years ago, there yeah. was there's a there's a wellness practice that you know that he throws in there um, that's yeah. good for the body. That's awesome. Yeah, and and we could and now we would have to have a study to believe it, right? That, <laughs> uh, but yeah. these but you're right. I mean, these are things that are well established and known. Yeah. So maybe to kind of round up the discussion, I uh, don't. Again, I don't have my clock with me, so I should have had it with me. Anyways, um, it seems like, so we've been talking about kind of a, in the medical sense, like, you know, studying broadly is, is, is helpful there. Like you, you shouldn't specialize, you know, narrow focus into one area because it kind of limits you. Um, when we're talking about classically educated kids or, or kids who are more broadly studied, um, like I said, taking a more holistic look at the universe, studying the universe more holistically, what kinds of things do, I mean, obviously you have to have some sort of economic goal in the temporary sense because you, I mean, you've got to pay for stuff, <laughs> but what do kids like that go on to do? Is, is there any, um, in, in your experience, is there anything that your students are more drawn to or, um, you know, what are your kind of thoughts there? Um, there e either of you. Yeah, they're all literature teachers now. Um, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> well, I don't know. You tell just me. kidding. You tell me. Uh, <laughs> no, I th I think that's the that's the stereotype, right? Is that um, they all end up teaching literature and history or Latin or something? Um, and I actually do have some former students that do that, but that's very very small number. Um, I have um, I know that there are. Um, some of my students who are very strong students, very, uh, they did wonderful in uh, a classical school setting, a classical uh, curriculum. Um, and I know some who are, um, who are in, in medicine now. Um, I have a former student who's a, a veterinarian. Um, I have students who work in, um, in finance and economics, um, students who work in uh, pursuing uh, the legal profession uh, in education. I mean, so it's, it's really all over, all over. Um, there's not really been a confining um, result to having a classical education. And of course there are some who go on to pursue that, you know, they want to, um, they want to teach, they want to, to work in the humanities or um, 
so on. And then, uh, you know, I have a lot of former students who are homemakers and homeschooling moms now. Um, and so classical education, if you're looking for the, the practical outworking of it, it, it's shaping who you are. It's cultivating, you know, wisdom and virtue in, in your, in your soul, in your life. I mean, that's the, that's the hope. Um, but it, it teaches you how to learn. And so from there, you can really go on to, to study whatever, if it, the, the more narrow you do want to get, you can do that. Um, but you can also, you're also equipped to learn new things. And I think that that's the real benefit of classical education is that it is intensely practical because it is not pragmatic, right? It's not a knee jerk reaction to whatever the, the newest, hottest upcoming specialization is. It's enabling you to learn. So then you can go and learn all, all kinds of things. I mean, um, I think Nathan is a good example of this personally. Um, I, I like to think that it's one of the reasons why I've been able to do uh, the different things that, that I've done um, professionally and in my, my work life. Um, but classical education enables you to learn. And so I've, I've seen students go into any number of fields. Um, and I think that really does get back. We didn't really define wisdom and virtue themselves, which um, uh, you know would probably be a whole other podcast, but but I, I will just throw this out real quick. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, the first times that, that scripture uses the words wisdom, it's not in the sense that we think. It's not in Proverbs um, and it's not in this nebulous um, uh, sort of guy sitting on a straw mat on the top of a mountain kind of, <laughs> kind of idea. It, um, it's intensely practical. In fact, the first time the words are used, um, it's in the book of Exodus. Uh, in Exodus 31, where God is choosing out the craftsmen to, to build the tabernacle in the temple. Interesting. Um, yeah. So the, and it's translated in like the ESV that I commonly use, uh, the word is, is typically translated as skill, but it's the same word for wisdom that Solomon uses in Proverbs. It's the same mm -hmm. word used for what God gave to Solomon when he became king. Um, and so wisdom is not just knowing things, right? It's not just knowing uh, philosophy or, or deep proverbs. Wisdom is actual, it, as Doug Wilson likes to say about our theology, right? It comes out your fingertips, right? Mm -hmm. Wisdom does translate into action, which is why when you go to Proverbs, you see Solomon talking about knowledge, which is kind of that base level of knowing things, um, information and then understanding which is how all that information can be sorted out and understood and um, you're starting to piece and weave things together um, and then uh, it, and then it lives itself out in wisdom which is the best definition I think of wisdom that I've read is the ability to live life skillfully right it's to navigate and make wise decisions wherever you are in whatever context you're in um, and so wisdom is a is it, it, it lives itself out. It shows itself. It's manifested in, in actions and being able to do. And I think that that's very important. Virtue is the same way in the King James version in Luke eight, when Jesus uh, heals the woman who had the issue of blood, right. Um, and she touches the hem of his garment and he says, I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. Right. It's um, it's power. It's the ability to accomplish what's needed at the time, the ability to do good in a particular context. And and so um, I think we have to be very careful, particularly as classical educators. Right. Because we can knee jerk react to against pragmatism and we fly to the other side where we we are. We're talking about. No, no, no. We're not going to talk about doing anything. Right. <laughs> we're yeah. going to read books and we're going to talk about those books and then you're going to go back home and read more books. Um but, and that's the way a lot of classical educators live. I'm sorry, it, it is. Um, but at some point we need to actually think about what that means and in, in what we should be doing in our actions. Yeah. But anyway, sorry, I, I hijacked the podcast there for a minute. Oh, good. Go yeah, that, that is excellent. I, I couldn't have said it better. It actually, that last part uh, reiterated why um, at New College, our kind of tagline is wisdom, virtue, and service. And Oh, that's great. If you understand wisdom and virtue the way that Brian talks about it. You don't need to put that word service in there. Right. But because so often in classical circles, they don't think of it that way. 
we put service in there too to emphasize the the fingertips idea yeah um, good yeah yeah don't don't take it out anytime soon yeah, yeah right <laughs> yeah, we gotta keep that in there just and so i mean i've had a similar experience to brian in terms of seeing that my students have gone into every field um but i wanted to talk about historically um the roots of classical education and how that reinforces why it's the case that people who are classically educated can go into any field. So um, the, in one sense, the uh, classical education is rooted in the way the Greeks did things, but primarily it's rooted actually in the middle ages. So um, with the Carolingian Renaissance in France and then uh, moving to kind of the high middle ages um, with the beginning of the universities in the 1200s. The idea of the university was that you'd spend eight years studying the liberal arts, the seven liberal arts. So that's grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And uh, that's the basis. From then, you can study law, you can study theology, you can study medicine. Um, and the recognition was that what it means to be human is that you learn in process. You're not, you're not born with innate knowledge. And you're not even born with the innate ability to know everything. It's yeah. a, you have to grow into that. And so the liberal arts was the idea that it equips you with all of the categories and tools and ways of thinking necessary for you to then learn other things. And there's, and there's amazing um, stuff you wanna read like uh, all the way back, St. Clement of Alexandria in the second century up through um, Rubanus Maris and uh, Aquinas. And all these guys talk about how, even with our knowledge of God, which is like the, the pinnacle of, of what it means to be human, is to know and love God. Even that is built on the foundation of the knowledge and wisdom and ability that you gain through study of other things. You're not just born with knowledge of God. And faith itself, um, is in one sense the foundation of all learning, right? To even have just kind of a preliminary knowledge and love of God provides the foundation for everything else. But theology was understood to be the queen of the sciences, the pinnacle of your education, because the liberal arts and then training in philosophy was the ladder up to the deep knowledge of God, the, the meat that, um, that we see talked about in scripture. A lot of those, uh, a lot of those big colleges, their mottos are like explicitly theological. Like I think it's Yale, Yale's motto is like "In your light, we see light," or maybe it's not Yale, but they're yeah, a lot of them are yeah pretty explicit about it. Right, and so the idea is, I think so often we can we can think without um, thinking about education that much. You can be a good person, you can do good things, and you can know and love God. And like education here or there, you know, mm -hmm. that's really just to kind of get you a job. Um, and that's not how, going back to what Brian said about having to understand what it means to be human before understanding education. The idea is that you can't do any of those things without being educated uh, in one way or another. And that's what, what kind of Christians through the centuries um, have believed and emphasized. So I, I tell my students, um, you know, you don't need to go to seminary after you graduate. You don't need to go become a teacher after you graduate. You just need to go do something and you're gonna be better equipped for it um, because of what you've, how you've been educated. And I told him that I would be thrilled if some of them went to trade school. We haven't really talked about trade school much. Yeah, yeah. Trade school yeah. is a great pinnacle to your classical education. Yeah, it is. The topping, the icing. Yeah. Brian, you want to talk more about that? Well, I think I think that's a great it's a it's a great question um, because I do think that the assumption among most uh, classical educators and and parents who you know want a classical education for their children, I do think that the assumption is we do all that so that they can go be a doctor or lawyer or something else that's going to make. A lot of money right um so even though on one hand you know they're talking about 
wisdom and virtue. That's normally like the elementary years when they're really cute. You know, the kids are really cute. And then they're, they're teenagers and you're looking at tuition bills and you're like, yeah, but um, <laughs> how do we pay for all this? Um, I want to return on my investment. Um, and, and parents would never say that out loud, but that's really what's going on in their minds. Um, and, and that kind of stress is understandable. It is. I'm not making light of that. Um, but I do find it interesting, uh, you know, when as classical educators, we, we, we kind of push the idea a lot, a lot do I'm speaking in big generalizations, a lot don't, but a lot do uh, assume that every one of the graduates from their, their school is going to go to a four year university. Right. And, um, and in fact, if you look at school profiles, you can look at classical school profiles, go to, go to their website and they'll have like a student profile, most likely. And that's going to tell you where their graduates went to college, how many, you know, what their scholarship dollars were, not individual students, but total, how many scholarships did they get? What was the average SAT score or ACT score? And like, how are you, how are you any different than a typical government school? If that's how you're measuring your students, how are you any different? Um, it's not, it's not any different whatsoever. Um, and so I think that uh, we got we have to rid ourselves of that notion. Um, and I think that does go back to understanding man, understanding man's purpose, understanding the, the understanding wisdom and virtue in the sense of that it, it shows by what comes out in your life and what you do. Um, but I have, so for example, let me give you just a very concrete example from my own life. So I'm not just talking about other people. Um, I think that trade schools are a good option, if nothing else, for their practical value. And because classically educated people who go into trades are going to be the best at those trades. Because if they have learned wisdom and virtue, then they can one, learn the trade and do it well. Two, they will end up being innovators in the trade because they know how to think. So they're, yeah. they're not just doing things by rote memorization. They're doing it because they actually understand, you know, they're learning how to learn and they're learning how to learn in a specific setting. And so, um, and not only that, but, you know, I think that um, as Christians, we need more and more to be contributing um, into the lives of our communities, the lives of our, our congregations, our church. Um, and, and I think we've sort of lost that. We've, we've lost that sense of, you know, loving your neighbor um, works itself out in very concrete ways. And so I would love to see a bunch of classically educated plumbers. I would love to see <laughs> classically educated electricians. Yeah. Um, and, and not only that, but I would love to see it for the fact that those classically educated plumbers can, can be working uh, professionally when they're 20 years old and not have a dime of debt and be making $80,000 a year. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, so why can't, why can't you have both? I mean, in this ignorant, and I use that in the the truest sense of the word is that we don't seem to know this, right? We don't have the knowledge of this. Um, the ignorant assumption is that if you work in the trades, then you're poorly educated and you don't make money, right? right? You, you can't provide for your family. Um, and then the, the older you get and the more you meet people who work in the trades, you're like, wait, wait a minute. Um, I still remember uh, there's a very successful businessman in our church. He's a great man uh, and a good friend. Um, he does very well for himself. And I still remember uh, he and his family, his, uh, his wife's siblings. I mean, they, they had a whole big family trip, um, probably, you know, 20 to 30 people. And they had to find a house big enough to fit all of these people. And sure enough, the house that they ended up uh, renting for the week for this family trip. It was, it was gigantic, a uh, beautiful house in the mountains. And the man who built it and owned it was an electrician. Yeah. And, you know, so he goes and he's like, oh, of course you are, you know? <laughs> I mean, so I just mentioned that anecdotally because I, I think it would do us, uh, it would do us a lot of good to, um, 
stop being pragmatists and and be practical as well and realize that the outgrowth of classical education is that you you can learn just about anything and do it really well yeah you know, if you put those and, things into practice yeah in my profession uh so i work in a field where there's a lot of accountants cpas auditors um that sounds the, awesome. most but the, it well no. uh, it can be <laughs> It can be um, <laughs> if you don't have the right uh, personality, I guess. Yeah, sorry. Um, but but a lot of uh, I, I think that one of the most important and the most useful skills that in, in my profession where I work is writing and communication. Like just being able to write well is solve can solve so many issues that we have. <laughs> um, so it, it's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, we specialize. We we have a whole bunch of CPAs in the office, you know, just you know, siloed, strict siloed study. But the most important thing is is writing. It seems so. I know a guy who uh, is a financial advisor, and whenever he's looking to hire somebody, he asks them, "What do you read?" Mm. And if they only read business and finance stuff, he doesn't hire them. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, there's I mean, a reason for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that goes back to the, the what's the distinction between, um, that's made a lot of times uh, the cultivating soft skills, right? People skills, being able to, to interact with others. And I do think classical education uh, with the focus on literature, history, humanities, it, it does help you cultivate that, right? Um, and helps you understand people and stories and um and it does teach you to write and to think and to, to see other viewpoints. And so in that sense, it, it prepares you for, for any number of things, you know, whether it's, um, you know, finance or something where you, you can be really um, particular and, and siloed, like you said, or, um, or working with a broad range of people. So it does, I think it prepares you for, for whatever, but I don't think uh, as far as trade schools go, I, I think it's something that we need to, to speak more highly of and and really think through as a as a benefit. Yeah, awesome. All right, uh, I think we've been going for a while. Is there anything that you guys want to kind of close out with before we before we end? No. All right. Well, thank you both. Thank you, Brian, especially being the special guest. Um, of course. I have. Uh, you know, there's lots of guests that we have on and I'm like, I really would like to have them back on. Um, and you're definitely one of those. So maybe sometime in the future, we can dive into the, maybe the EMT stuff. That'd be really cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, sure. So, all right. Well, thank you. And how do we end it, Nathan? Love God, love neighbor, build something. You got it. All right. <laughs>